The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Well, is the past a foreign country? Do they do things differently there? It was certainly true in hip surgery. Hip replacements have come a long way from experiments with ivory in the 1800s to cutting-age robotics today. But how far have we come, really? In my tireless quest to bring you new and exciting things to discuss, I found this article from the journal Hip International today. It was published 30 years ago. Back then, I was a senior registrar at the General Hospital in Birmingham, working for the legendary Sir Keith Porter on Team 2. We operated day and night. It was an amazing and unforgettable time. So what is the article all about? Well, it's a review of what was learned from the previous 30 years of modern hip surgery and what might happen in the future. So let's have a look and see how things have changed in the last 60 years. The authors told us about the early days of hip replacements, going back to the 19th century, when a German surgeon called Gluck used ivory to replace the joints of people who had TB. At first they worked well, but because antibiotics weren't available then, there was a very high risk of failure due to infection, so they were abandoned. Modern hip replacements were developed in the 1950s by teams of surgeons and engineers, mainly in Europe and America. It was very much trial and error, and the results weren't always predictable. Sir John Charney in Manchester was pivotal in putting together a system that allowed the operation to be reproducible and consistent. This meant that it could be scaled up and taught to new surgeons around the world. Of course, there were failures, but scientists, pathologists and engineers studied the mechanisms of failure so that better materials and techniques could be developed. In 1995, when the paper was published, hip replacements hadn't really changed that much from Charney's hip. They were made from the same materials like stainless steel, titanium and polyethylene. We knew that when they were used in young people, they'd wear out within 10 to 15 years and, need of, and they'd need often quite complex revision surgery to sort them out. We used to try and put people off having surgery for as long as possible because of this. Metal on metal hip resurfacing was just about to be rolled out, but many surgeons were sceptical about it. But within a few years, the demand for it was enormous. So what did the authors conclude from their study? The most important conclusions were these. Firstly, we must follow up our patients so that we know how their hips are doing in the long term. Second, the best way of improving what we do is to proceed with small steps. Evolution, not revolution. Finally, we must learn from failure. If a hip replacement goes wrong, we must study it to see what happened. They observed that the main causes of failure are dislocation of the hip, infection and loosening of the implants caused by wear of the bits that rub together, the bearing surfaces. But what about the future? Well, they wondered about which types of hip replacements would be successful and less likely to wear out, and whether or not metal bearings would be better than what was available then. 30 years later, what's changed? Well, the implants that we use are still made from much the same materials, and they look very similar. Modern plastics and ceramics have virtually eliminated wear issues. The risks of dislocation and infection have reduced, but they haven't gone away. They were right about making progress in small steps. There were some terrible problems with metal-on-metal -metal hips about 15 years ago, and we learned some big lessons from this particularly in how new devices are introduced with much tighter regulation and scrutiny. The National Joint Registry was set up 20 years ago. It logs every joint replacement done in England and Wales so that if one of them were to fail, we surgeons are told when that patient has had to have revision surgery. It's been a game changer. But what about the things they didn't predict? Well, hip surgery has become a super speciality I was one of the few specialist hip surgeons when I started as a consultant, but now there are hundreds, if not thousands of us in the UK alone. We have better techniques to plan surgery. Robots are commonly used, but the jury's out on whether or not they make a big enough difference to justify the cost. We get people out of hospital within a day or two compared with a week or more 30 years ago. This means that we can do more cases, which is so important when we have a rapidly aging population. The boomer bulge is certainly having an effect. The biggest changes that I've seen are the increasing numbers of younger patients who have hip replacement or resurfacing. People's expectations have changed. They're not prepared to put up with pain and disability. On the other hand, obesity is a growing problem and this does have a big impact on the risk of complications after surgery. What will the next generation of surgeons be doing in 30 years? 
My guess is that things won't be that much different in terms of the surgery and the materials that are used. If something has worked well for decades, why change it? Day case surgery will be the normal standard of care. Ceramic resurfacing may well be established. We'll know much more about how people react to the materials that we use. This will help us to make better choices about your treatment. It will be the era of truly personalised care. Maybe there'll even be a cure for osteoarthritis, but I think a lot of surgeons might not be too happy if this happens. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and a happy new year to all of you.